again, I have the honor to introduce people, <laughs> which is actually really nice to do. Um, it would be nice to in person, but, but never mind, here we are. So this is the, the, the uh, final uh, academic scientific uh, session, and uh, I'm only here to introduce one person, and this is uh, the moderator of the session. Um, this is uh, Biga Tunscher, and Biga will uh, moderate the uh, keynote, uh, the closing keynote with Michael Hensel, uh, and then also the round table where we have most of the speakers from the last two days, um, uh, not around the table, but, but around the globe. Uh, so that's kind of nice. Um, now, Biga Tunscher, um, some of you, of course, know her. Uh, she's an uh, associate uh, professor of architecture uh, and sustainable design at Singapore University of Technology and Design. Uh, pr prior to, to joining the Singapore University of Technology and Design, uh, she was a visiting professor at ETH Zurich uh, in, in Switzerland and also an assistant professor in uh, TU Delft. So one could say that she sort of went through some of the best schools that we can offer within the architectural community. Um, she also worked as a chair for architecture and a chair for computer added design at the ETH Zurich, uh, has been principal investigator and uh, participant of a number of uh, funded research projects without which it doesn't work as we all know. And uh, as you see now, she regularly leads scientific workshops, gives lectures internationally, uh, analog and digital, of course. Um, now, I think your career started like in 1996 or even before. So you've been around the architecture thing for a while. Uh, and uh, you witnessed the first steps of the digital towards where we are now. So um, a warm welcome for uh, Biga Tuncha, the moderator of the last session here, uh, which may be uh, the most difficult task effect of, of the conference. So um, welcome Biga and the stage is yours. Thank you very much Liz. Uh, thanks for, for inviting me for this. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I will start by welcoming Michael Hansel to his keynote speech. So uh, first, uh, this is the last keynote speech of the conference. Uh, I tried to follow the keynote speeches from the recordings on YouTube. And uh, this is the final keynote speech of the conference, uh, which will be done by Michael Hansel, which I think you will also know uh, from, from all his previous work. Michael is an architect and a partner in ocean architecture and environment. He is a co-founder of the international net network practice Ocean, and he was partner in Ocean North and founding and acting chairperson of Ocean Design Research Association. He is a steering board member of Lemo Lab Research Center in Tuscany, Italy, and book series editor of the Springer Nature series, Designing Environments. Currently, he is a professor at Vienna University of Technology, where he leads the research department for digital architecture and planning. Previously, he taught at the AA School of Architecture in London, Berlach Institute in Amsterdam, Oslo School of Architecture and Design, TU Munich, Rice University, and University of Technology in Sydney. He was the founding and acting director of the Research Center for Architecture and Tectonics, and this innovation hub, the Advanced Computational Design Laboratory in Oslo. He was also an innovation fellow at the University of Sydney and honorary fellow of the Institute of Advanced Studies at the Technical University of Munich. So with this introduction, I welcome Michael to his talk today with the title, En route to embodied architectures and why anthropological inquiry cannot be exclusively anthropocentric. Uh, Michael, please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, generous introduction, and thank you also to the entire team of uh, ECAD -E for inviting me to give a uh, keynote here. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, I hope this is going to work fine. Um, so, see my first slide. Yes, we can. Okay, but you are great. not in presentation mode. Oh, I'm not in okay. presentation mode. What do now, I have to do? Now you are. Now you are. It's perfect. Okay. okay. Um, 
In this talk, I will introduce the notion of embedded architectures that is located at the intersection between architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, environmental science, ecology, agronomy, and computational and data science. I will also argue that the theme of anthropological inquiry in the context of architecture and environment integration cannot exclusively be approached from an anthropocentric perspective without risking to close vital routes to sustainable design and sustainable development. I would like to initiate my argument with a quote, quote by Larry Busbier, uh, who wrote in his foreword to the 2019 edition of Maldonado's Design, Nature and Revolution Towards a Critical Ecology, first published in 19, uh, 1972. Quote, to design in an environment is to design an environment, unquote. Most current environmental related approaches will point to some extent to the United Nations Sustainable Goals. Clearly, each of these goals is complex in and of itself. The sustainability problem is complex in nature and requires the cut across scales and domains. Also, the goals are clearly interrelated and assert mutual impact. With this, the question arises how to balance uh, different aspects and needs. This alludes to the fact that multitudes of trade-offs will arise that need understanding and evaluation, and that can lead to decision support systems, especially in areas of high complexity. Before humans started transforming the environment through construction, Local living species and ecosystems interacted in an unmediated way with the geophysical uh, environment. With increasing construction, this interaction is unavoidably mediated by construction. Architecture needs to take full responsibility for this mediation. Two questions arise from this realization. The first, can architecture be in the service of the natural environment and Second, going a step further, can architecture and environment be integrated in some meaningful way? The tension between anthropocentric ecology and ecosystem ecology is frequently hotly debated in terms of environmental ethics, which is a discourse that I will not address here. However, this tension can be productive if the intent is to identify a spectrum of different trade-off scenarios for design that can inform choices in terms of which data sets to engage with and how. In other words, we can identify here relevant criteria and input for design. Agroecological approaches, for instance, as plant biodiversity, i.e. what will be planted, and its relation to associated biodiversity, i.e. what will occur due to the plant biodiversity, for instance, different types of uh, microbiomes in the ground, but also occasionally uh, makes use of natural biodiversity, i.e. in pest control. There are clear trade-offs between human needs, i.e. food production, and to some extent ecosystem uh, to maintain desired species. So don't worry, you're still in a, in, a, uh, in a conference about architecture. <clears throat> this could offer an interesting inroad to rethinking the relation between architecture and environment from a multi-species perspective. As such, this requires establishing trade-off scenarios that inform design. And as such, the priority cannot be exclusively placed on human needs alone. A brief example from our past research from a few years back is the question of bushfires, which we investigated on the example of the Kuringai Chase National Park in Sydney. Bushfires are needed for local ecosystems to renew themselves and plant species have different bushfire survival strategies. Natural bushfires have a specific frequency, intensity and duration. If any of those are changed due to human intervention, 
The resulting new frequency, intensity and duration of bushfires are hardly survivable for the bush itself. Therefore, unless we follow the argument of some sort of politicians that forests and bushes are the problem and therefore should be removed, it will be necessary to inform designs in, uh, in or near bushfire areas with the conditions that the bush can survive. This draws the trade-off in the direction of ecosystems ecology. Indigenous practices can also offer valuable insights in this respect and how also human needs can be catered for in the same move. It is of interest to take note of the fact that an increasing number of research-oriented practices are investigating the interaction between constructions and green systems, whether from an anthropocentric, ecological or agroecological perspective. This is also the type of research and research-driven design in which my practice engages in. We split our activities into practice-based research with focus on designing environments and more formal research based on understanding environments. These tasks are respectively undertaken in the context of the Lamo Lab Research Center in Tuscany and our practice ocean architecture environment. Through this combination, we pursue and approach architecture environment integration uh, through an, a notion that we entitle embedded architectures. This entails that we do not only design buildings, we design environments. We try to maintain terrain. We try to maintain and diversify microclimate. We maintain or instigate ecosystems. Uh, we incorporate systems, objects, actors. We foreground processes and practices. Practices alone would have been an interesting subject matter for this particular mm -hmm. ECAT E and uh, its relation to the computational processes in that respect. From a methods perspective, our approach integrates multimodal data acquisition, data structuring and integration, information modeling via computational ontologies, transcalar and multi domain modeling and simulations into an advanced design computing framework. The upper scale limit is frequently the cartographic scale, which involves geographic information systems and the combination and analysis of data on territorial scale down to local scales. This enables us to discern potential conflicts between the existing and the proposed, as well as identifying potentials for design intervention that integrate architecture and environment through multiple trade-off considerations. Our approach develops both in practice and in academia. One example is a project for a suburban densification on Nesoten, a peninsula near Oslo, that is characterized by explicit terrain form, dense vegetation and agriculture. So how to densify in this kind of situation? An initial approach was developed by our practice that employs extensive terrain, vegetation and climate related analysis, leading to an approach of developing architecture suited to the existing terrain form and its related distribution based on the undertaken analysis. In addition, the placement of necessary circulation systems was equally informed by the existing terrain form. Subsequently, we gave the design problem to our students who delved deeper into computer-aided analysis. They developed a larger range of building typologies matched to specific terrain forms and set out computational workflows for the location and orientation of different types, which involved geomorphons, a pattern recognition approach to classification and mapping of landforms contained in various geographic information software packages, as well as environmental aspects such as daylight analysis in the context of dense vegetation. However, this project remained more on the scale of planning and landscape architecture. In subsequent semesters, we pursued different sites, for instance, Val Lomnezia in the Swiss canton of Graubünden, characterized by steep mountains and high altitude agriculture. Students established again hybrid architectural typologies with an explicit interface to local fl flora and set out clear working processes for developing designs. 
This involved the identification of critical design parameters for computational modeling and the identification and utilization of relevant data. Uh, and that data can actually come from the cartographic scale or any uh, scale below that. This led to the definition of iterative and linked computational uh, design and analysis processes. Various distribution patterns of buildings were developed and evaluated and developed in terms of the building program and the architecture articulation of building clusters. Design strategies were developed not only for plan arrangements, but also for sectional strategies involving environmental and terrain characteristics. However, the details, tectonic articulation of the individual buildings are not yet integrated into the workflow. Uh, design, the designs are now going uh, beyond the planning scale, however, uh, and so we have uh, uh, begun to integrate a broader palette of uh, scale range. Furthermore, what was still missing is the specific interaction between constructions, local microclimate, and local flora. This requires an approach that involves even more scales down to individual buildings, individual plants, etc. As such, this also requires elaborating interactions between different scales and thereby a shift from working on discrete scales towards transscalar and transdomain modes and models. As an example of understanding environments, we are studying traditional ways of facilitating high quality food production in adverse environments that are at the same time correlated with questions of ecosystem preservation and the interaction of ecosystems and food production. This entails a lot more data acquisition as is normally the case in architecture, as well as understanding the data and making it available and actionable for design. Multimodal data acquisition and analysis thus becomes a field of expertise for data integrated and data driven design. For this purpose, we are developing computational workflows in which data is integrated and analyzed and subsequently fed into an interdisciplinary decision support system. Working at the intersection between architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, environmental science, ecology, agronomy, data and computer science involves the need to permanently expand knowledge, methods and skills. To facilitate this endeavor, we have started a symposium series that examines the relation between architecture and environment from different disciplinary perspectives in order to engender inter and transdisciplinary discourse. In addition, we have started a new book series with Springer Nature Publishers that is entitled Designing Environments to seek for new interdisciplinary insights and knowledge and to share our findings with the community in a true research spirit. I hope this brief excursion into the embedded architecture approach triggered your curiosity into the subject matter so that new collaborations can arise to advance design computation in this direction. I would like to thank my collaborators, first and foremost, my wife and partner in crime, Daphne Sungoolo Hensel and from my department, especially Jakob Titz, who also presented in ecat -E. My students at Vienna University of Technology, especially Tina Salamin, Fabian Pitscheider, whose projects were shown, and our collaborators at the University of Florence, especially Professor Grazia Tucci, EPFL in Lausanne, especially Professor Claudia Binder and Professor Jeffrey Hahn, and Technical University Munich, especially Professor Ferdinand Ludwig. With that, thank you for your kind attention. Um, I suppose then I stop sharing. Yes, thank you, Michael. This was super interesting and very close to, to my heart, uh, especially. Um, so uh, you are talking about specifically understanding environments and designing environments as an interlinked uh, uh, process, part of a, of a process that is interlinked that is multidisciplinary to lead to embedded architectures 
that uh, kind of uh, and, uh, expand our horizons as, as architects. We are talking about ecosystem, but in, in the sense of uh, these, these trade-offs, we of course have to be um, very careful in terms of how we handle and approach these trade-offs, right? So um, for, for your uh, work, Let's let's talk about, for example, that project of uh, the high quality food production and e ecosystem preservation. Could you tell us a bit more in detail what kind of data you collect and what is your approach, uh, if if you can, in a, uh, a in a in a way of a summary, going a bit more into detail. Uh, the project that I showed. Uh in Tuscany is actually an investigation into a small uh, valley called uh, Lamole, in which wine is produced, a high quality red wine is produced at uh, higher altitudes than uh, normally possible. Uh, and their uh, human construction, meaning the land transformation into terraces and the implementation of dry stone walls, makes that extent possible. Uh, but our most recent surveys are beginning to show that it's not only that, uh, it is also the, the kind of small land mosaic uh, of small fields interrupted by crevasses where uh, rainwater runs off, um, which are basically natural areas, green uh, natural areas. And the interaction between these two is really quite interesting from a microclimatic perspective. Uh, but also it is interesting to look closer to more unassuming scales where you begin to realize that uh, wine farmers in different places of the world and in La Mole too, uh, allow certain plants that naturally occur to grow in the vineyard in order to generate what you might call a, a vineyard biotope. Uh, and these uh, these kinds of interactions between plant, soil, microclimate and so on uh, affect also the quality of the wine. So it's of human benefit to somehow uh, not go monoculture. And it is perhaps to some extent uh, of benefit for biodiversity and also for uh, the remnants of uh, the natural ecosystems that still exist not to be eradicated just to have a few more meters in your field because the loss in quality uh, would be tremendous whereby the the, the loss in uh, uh, the, the increase in quantity of output of wine is negligible. So here we have we have trade-offs that are happening on multiple uh, levels. And uh, ecosystem is one aspect, but there are many other aspects that play into that um, um, that are interrelated. Uh, without which uh, it would be uh, any understanding would only be partial, and uh, our understanding will always be partial, but it can be enriched through an interdisciplinary approach. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so that brings me to my next question, really. When you have this uh, multi-source, uh, multi-scale, multi-time data that you collect, you integrate, you analyze, uh, it leads to some insights and ultimately to some policy and design uh, evidence that are used for changing an environment or building a new environment to generate knowledge, right? So how do you see in, in this context, you with your computational environment that you that you showed us, which is super interesting, how do you see the translation of or even generating design or supporting design decisions? to be translated from context to context, uh, climate to climate, the different uh, conditions that different climates and different sites bring and even different cultures bring, how do you see the translation of the collection of data, organization, analysis, etc., to, de to deriving evidence and ultimately to designing the generalizability of it? Yes, so generalizability, uh, at least from our perspective, has to happen with a degree of caution. Um, first of all, uh, just a, a quick uh, sidestep to say something about data. 
through this research, throughout this research, we were always sort of half in the dark uh, because we stumbled upon things that other people were looking at that we had no clue uh, uh, or we had no clue that they could be important for us. Uh, often you, you operate on a hunch and you try and see what uh, other people are looking at, uh, how, whether that might affect your own research. So it's kind of half in control, half out of control. Uh, and it's always a struggle to see what you do with uh, the data that you obtain and how you can understand uh, the interrelation between things that you've never thought about before. That's one thing. And you're quite right to point out that uh, there's a great deal of local specificity uh, in terms of practices of land transformation, uh, in what kind of climate situations do they take place? Uh, are we looking at hot and dry climates? Are we looking at colder and wet climates? Are we looking at climates with frost? So there is a limit to the transferability of these systems. But within that, there's a, a, a great potential of adaptation for these systems. So for instance, what, uh, what I could imagine, and this is now just really talking into the blue, I have no, um, no uh, um, work or anything as of yet that is pointing in that direction, but it would be interesting to see if you did a building that is terraced in a similar climate zone to uh, and a sufficiently large building in a climate zone similar to, to La Mole, uh, could you start on these terraces to obtain uh, high quality food in a, in a kind of urban setting? But then again, the next question comes, it, it, those, those areas that you assign for food production cannot just be for food production. There also needs to be this kind of interspersed sort of wild areas because they interact with the food production area in uh, uh, often beneficial ways. So how do you bring this entire complexity uh, into a new design scenario, um, but under the provision of being very cautious that you don't step outside of the, the, the limits of the system that you're working with, that you start implementing something uh, in um, Greenland that maybe originates from the Mediterranean, although, Maybe Greenland will be in that bracket sometime soon. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, being cautious. Yes. Excellent. So, uh, do we have here any questions from the audience? I do not see any. I, of course, have to uh, extend this conversation more. Liz, uh, what is the plan here? Should can we do we have more time to 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 extend this or do we? I need to have a on? question. Yeah, I think we do have time. Uh, a little bit more time. Uh, I mean, if there, there is one question. I mean, what are, I, the question. things? Um, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt the flow. So um, I think that um, I would say Thomas. It's yeah, your I'm question. It's your question Michael. time, Thomas. So, okay, Michael. Uh, excellent presentation, and uh, you mentioned uh, many times the term computational tools. So I'm interested uh, if uh, what kind of tools did you use, and did you include, uh, for example, GeoPanda, geospatial tools like GIS, urban growth models. Envisioning models? Did you use artificial intelligence, machine learning? Did you use scripting, coding? Um, so, uh, first and foremost, uh, most of our uh, experimentation in the office and uh, more so also in the university depends a little bit on availability of tools. But fortunately, my department at the Technical University in Vienna is uh, digital architecture and planning, which basically means that uh, we can take planning tools into the domain of architecture and vice versa and let the students work with it. So our first uh, um, attempt was to note the word in digital architecture and planning, not digital architecture or planning, and to bring these tool sets together, which involve geographic information systems, which often in several packages also have uh, certain analytical uh, uh, tools or tools that could be used for some to some extent for simulation involved and that was already a a big conceptually because uh, for us and also for the students 
uh, there's always an issue when you get data from a scale that you perceive to be outside of your uh, area of expertise. What do you do with this data? How do you do you facilitate this? So the question is not only the interoperability between tools. The question is also how we open this up conceptually. Uh, but we work in principle with readily available tools so far. Um, so uh, uh, through Jakub Titz, we were able to bring in uh, QGIS, SagaGIS, uh, with all the, the different kinds of functions that we have there, uh, connect that with Rhino and Grasshopper, uh, then bringing in incrementally, step by step, a variety uh, of analytical tools, either directly out of the Grasshopper environment or from somewhere else. At the same time, uh, my wife, uh, Daphne Songrolo Hensel, she's working with computational uh, ontologies as a way of information or knowledge modeling. So we're approaching in principle from two sides. We're approaching from the side that uh, is to do with uh, how, wh what kind of tools do we have to obtain and integrate data and bring them uh, into what is more commonly recognizable design process and architecture. But we're also coming from the other side where we're trying to um, basically facilitate now uh, the handling of the complexity of data with decision support systems for designers uh, in the first place. Um, machine learning and artificial intelligence is not yet part of it, but we're discussing this. Uh, uh, you have maybe seen the presentation by Adam Sebastian and uh, 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 and Jakob Tietz. Uh, so uh, this is sort of an approach uh, on a, a much reduced, uh, but still fairly complex and data rich environment to come to terms with this before we uh, begin to unleash this uh, into, into the setup. Uh, and also, you know, one thing that is uh, also takes time is to develop the necessary teaching strategies because we're already totally overloading the students which means after the integration of a number of uh, tools, we have to say, what is the new normal? And how can, we, how can we describe this as a new normal and as an easy teaching inroad towards the student before we put the next big package on top? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, we have a question from the audience, Valmir Kastrati. I, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but the question is, uh, congratulations for the presentation. The question regards the post evaluation of the results. Did you develop or are you planning to develop some sort of digital system that evaluates the output of your results to keep track if the criteria uh, are being met? Or is, is, an, is it another way to evaluate, evaluate results? So the question is, how do you evaluate the results that your uh, system is producing in terms of evidence, in terms of um, uh, design recommendations, that these are correct? Yeah, this, this is a multi-level problem. If we have a single pipeline optimization process, I think for that methods are already well established. Uh, so it's not really so necessary to go into that. And even multi-objective optimization processes are kind of well established uh, to the extent that we know tools like uh, Octopus, for instance, where we can plot trade-offs, different types of trade-offs, different types of design scenarios with different trade-offs and evaluate them. But the question is really this, are we able to uh, deal with changing questions? And that's where the computational ontologies come in. The ontologies go beyond the database, they go beyond uh, optimization processes, although these can be uh, involved. Uh, in an ontology, the inquiry structures the information. Yeah, so we, we have to, in this multi-level problem, uh, the easiest is a simple optimization issue. But the more criteria come into play and the more that maybe the question changes, also alluding to your comment from earlier on that we need to take care of local differences, um, when the question changes, and maybe our evaluation criteria or the the the, the data hierarchy uh, changes. So it's a multi-level problem that we're looking at here. It's a problem from uh, structuring information all the way to structuring and evaluating data. Uh, with the risk of becoming a bit too specific, may I ask how you how you inform your ontology? Uh, how do you define 
the relations or how are the relationships in your ontology defined? I mean, uh, you have to have an underlying system for this, right? Or who defines it? Let's put it this way. No, the, the thing is we're working with uh, uh, generic software for the purpose, uh, which is a protege that was developed uh, at Stanford University, but we have to fill in the content. So basically... Yeah, that's the content. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. We, yeah. we, we have to establish the content. We have to say uh, uh, unambiguously uh, what a certain thing is and how it relates to another thing. Uh, so basically, you're building, uh, as it were, maybe uh, a, a semantic structure, but you can go beyond it. There are uh, uh, informatics aspects to that where you can actually bring, uh, we, you can link databases into uh, uh, ontologies. You can link other kinds of computational processes into that. Uh, the interesting thing about the ontology is that you need to be clear about the individual elements, but you also need to be clear about the inquiry. You cannot come necessarily with a fuzzy question to the system. So uh, both in building the, uh, the um, ontology and in uh, adapting and operating the ontology, great care is needed uh, in terms of making sure that there are no ambiguities in there because otherwise the system doesn't work. This is sometimes a little bit cumbersome for um, architects. Uh, we try to make a very simple ontology uh, uh, on, let's say, Corbusian architecture. Uh, and when you start discussing pilotes you, or columns, you may be discussing a great variety of different things where everybody would have a different definition. And then it becomes almost impossible to build an ontology. Ontology requires a clarity uh, in terms of building blocks, meaning the, the patients, etc., cetera, uh, and the way in which you want to inquire this. I don't know whether I've asked your, uh, I tried to say something about the software, I tried to say something about the inner logic, and I also something about the data uh, streams and the information that is being, um, and that the inquiry is an important factor here. Yes, thank you, Michael. I think that answers very, very well the question. So uh, I have a request from Liz here to move to the round table. While we are moving to the round table, I'm going to read the one last question uh, from Kai Reaver. Uh, oh. He says that they miss you in Norway. The question is, in COVID-19, we see large data sets of population movement being utilized by I think municipalities through mobile phones, etc. In your thesis, is this type of data anthropocentric or something else? So the question is: In COVID-19, large data sets, uh, data sets of population movement is being collected by municipalities, by governments. Um, is this data anthropocentric or is it something else? Hmm. Yeah. Uh... Large-scale movement data. For, first of all, for, I for the round table. To the round table now. This how do we do this? Is everyone from the round table already here as panelists? Uh, everybody is here. We have Michael is here. Yeah, here. Um, Chris Williams. Uh, Chris, mm. uh, I know that you're at next door, but are you also here? <laughs> okay, yeah. Kaz Osteris is here. Kaz, can we Hi, Kaz. It's been so long, Kaz. Nice to see you here. Oh, hi, Vika. How are you? Rachel Armstrong as well and uh, Secret. And yeah, everybody's here. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. I mean, it's now, if you can speak all together at the same time, that would be appreciated. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's wonderful. But it would be probably good to have people uh, switch on their videos if possible, right? Yes, I think also for uh, the audience, the attendees um, out there. Uh, so that yeah. can also, yeah, that's nice. Deepar is there too. Hello, Deepar. I can wave across my computer and see Deepar. Deepar Kering, Thomas, Cass. You, Chris. Ah, okay. Rachel, Secret. Hey, Secret. Every. Um. Okay.
Okay, Miss Al, maybe um, maybe we start with this last question, right? And and I will expand it a little bit. So uh, this whole depressing, you know, going back to Chris's speech, dep depressing depression, <laughs> uh, COVID situation is kind of the embodiment of depression these last months. Um, all this data collection about people's movement, who me too, we have here in Singapore safe entry, we have to, wherever we go, show our mobile phones and sign in, etc. So this this data collection, I mean, we, we are talking about in, in Michael's uh, lecture, but also in some other lectures, uh, modeling uh, human movement or other kinds of movements, large scale population, micro scale, et cetera, et cetera. To, to gain evidence about urban systems and to kind of improve, improve designs. So how do we relate to anthropocentric design? Who wants to tackle this question first? Rachel. Rachel. Hi. <laughs> yes, um, very interesting question. I, I mean, for, for us, um, we've been using artificial intelligence to observe, it's, it's quite cybernetic, you know, a system observing itself so that the microbes in our living architecture system, which is this like city of microbes, and each block is performing a particular assigned task. And so we have um, data collection, as it were, through sensors in the system that are observing how these microbes are performing. Um, and it's very interesting for me because I see what Yale's doing in New Haven, and they're taking data from the sewers. Um, and if you think about it, this living architecture that feeds on um, waste from a household is also a mini sewer. Um, and so we could actually use these kinds of systems to observe pathogens that are coming into the waste streams of a home. Um, and we could actually tell whether or not we have a pathogen in the system. So in some ways for me, the data collection in times like these is really about where we're directing our attention, where our values are, um, you know, what is this data for um, and how are we using it? So there are, there are you know, huge ethical questions and certainly coming from the UK, uh, we have a very political situation where we're getting private companies collecting um, data you know, through our mobile phones. And there's a big question of trust to do with that, um, you know, particularly as we've seen political consequences of these kinds of things. Um, so I think if, you know, the data collection itself um, you know, is, is something that we, that we do through our senses. Um, and when we do it through a computer, it's recorded, it's abstracted, and we kind of Place. Um, but there's a whole, whole ethical question, and it's really to do with building communities of trust, um, expanding notion of what we're responsible for as a human. So the de-anthropocentrization for me is considering the more than human. So my microbes on my body are really a kind of responsibility that I have, and that I need to think of that sphere and how my body is distributing microbes, and I need to be conscious of my actions. Data will help me do that. But that is because I would regard myself as a responsible citizen. There may be other people that you know want to use that uh, movement in order to uh, drive other agendas. So it's it's, it's complex, it's political, um, and it's economic. Um, and I think that these are agendas that architects should be taking on board. Yes, yes, I completely agree. Absolutely. Does anyone else want to pitch into this? Yeah, I would like to. To, uh, to add to Rachel's comments that uh, similar experiences happened in uh, Florida, in Miami. Due to the coronavirus, the water pollution and the air pollution dropped dramatically. And the traffic also decreased. So it was possible to bicycle, to skate, to walk, in a way within the city structures that has not been possible before. 
So it was actually a positive impact. And people uh, started to buy more and more bicycles. So not just toilet paper, also bicycles. They are very rare. And we could see suddenly dolphins and other fish types swimming again in certain areas of the bay or in rivers we have never seen before. And we could see the ground. And this has all changed when uh, the traffic opened up again. And the other impact is the, the radical rethinking how we are running universities in the United States also becomes obviously a challenge. Because most US universities, the, the biggest buildings we have are parking structures. Because most US universities are not connected to public transportation. So you have this gigantic fleets of pickup trucks and uh, oversized cars, students, faculty, staff included, that are coming into the campus. Now, all or well, most of these structures are empty, but we still have to pay the maintenance fees. So I was charged for the spring semester, for the summer semester, and now for the fall semester. Even I'm not at the main campus because of COVID-19, the pandemic, but we have to pay for it. And the overbloated administration needs to be also reduced because this is the new normal. So we have to rethink how we communicate, how we teach, how we work with each other. And it also creates more, more liberty, more free rooms for, for new ideas. Yes, exactly. I think that this has multiple dimensions, not only related to the pandemic, but also in relation to, to our future. In, with the effects of automation and um, automation in the urban environment and in the architectural environment, we will have to rethink many of these things, change our ways, change our philosophies and change our, our educational capabilities. So uh, is, does anyone want to chip in here into, in how automation, and here we are talking about uh, data science, AI, in terms of these uh, embedded uh, sensors everywhere in our environment, but also in terms of maybe um, autonomous vehicles that, that are becoming reality now and how, how this is changing our, our environment for the future and in, in relation to sustainability maybe. Anyone wants to chip in into this direction? I think fits with what has been discussed in the conference so far. Um, yes, well, I think, um... This, this raises lots of very interesting questions. I, I think um, well, one of the good things about the way that people think is that they try and take a lot of data or information and sort it into some sort of coherent model which they can understand. And um, from that, you might, for example, invent gods or religion of various sorts you uh, have moral feelings and so on. Um, I think now the concept of, of data or big data, which for some reason makes all computer scientists fall about laughing, um, <laughs> is um, uh, used to be quite interesting and, and one imagined all sorts of good things coming out of it, but it's now become a lot more um, sinister. And so the companies like Google, who were used to think of it being um, uh, quite cool, are now seen as quite sinister. And we're in the UK, <laughs> um, suffering from a, and in the US, suffering from uh, right wing governments. Very, um, so we don't really feel that government is on our side anymore. So it is really quite frightening. I, but I, I think that what we have to learn to be able to do is if we do use data, is that we have to explain to people how we've used that data to reach certain decisions um, in a, but not just say the data says this or the data says that, we have to explain why the data says this and how we've been able to interpret it. So we hear politicians saying, the scientists tell us to do this, so we have to do it. That, that doesn't make sense. What you need to do is, is to be able to go through and explain, we have this information and this information tells us this, and therefore we need to do this. 
people aren't stupid. Um, we have to find ways of explaining things without uh, using uh, numerical work as a sort of uh, way of hiding our thought processes as if it was coming down from some metaphysical higher being. Um, I think very much we have now we have we have people who understand the digital, who really understand the digital. We have people who uh, give the impression they understand it, and then the majority of the population doesn't understand it at all. So. Um, and I think it would be terrible if computer programmers become like 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 priests, basically, um, telling us all what to do on the basis of data. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's it's very important to to, to be positive about the future, and um, but also to be aware of of the dangers. Um, and it'd be interesting to think how things will seem twenty or thirty years from now. Looking back to the year 2020, as as to the way things were, but um, yeah, I, th I don't think there are any answers to these questions, but I think it's very interesting to talk about them. Thank you very much. Can I just want to make a because I think this issue of um, uh, data interpretation is really, really, really important. Um, you know, we we do the same thing with um, you know DNA sequencing, so you can sequence the human DNA. Um, it was helped with genome, but exactly what all the bits mean um, is, you know, still something that we haven't um, deciphered. You know, we're still discovering, you know, bits of meaning and junk DNA and all this kind of thing. And I, I think for me, there's there's something very interesting about um, the kinds of intelligence that we attribute to meaningful data. And so, kind of going back to the work with microbes. Um, you know, with these microbes you know, sitting in these little um, homes, um, they can detect changes in their environment and they can respond to them. So the question is actually, we're working with microbial intelligence that sits alongside the human algorithm that is looking at them. And there's a very interesting um, interface between different kinds of intelligences and different kinds of data. And I think for me, this becomes a very interesting kind of thing because can we hack a non-human intelligence? Um, you know, maybe you know, mi microbes can hack other microbes um, and it's just kind of diversifying the kinds and quality of data that we collect and how meaning is attributed to those data um, and then how that is interpreted and then what we do on the basis of that interpretation. And I think there are these levels that I think are, are quite interesting as our value framework shift. And we kind of move from an industrial kind of capitalist framework um, to something that's more ecological, inclusive, and um, you know, horizontal in terms of its distribution, and maybe more. Than Yes, yes, thank you. I Yes, the interpretation is, is absolutely super important. Um, I I would like to go a bit more into the, the effects of automation uh, as, as well. And I think Sigrid's presentation was in that direction. So I would maybe like to hear from you, Sigrid, if that's okay, related to this idea, uh, the, this topic that we are talking about now. <laughs> okay. Or... or, or something different also? <laughs> no, I think uh, what we have experienced in the last months is that um, the whole digitalization has changed how we work, how we live at home, uh, but not in a negative, but rather in a positive way, Yeah, that people realize that, okay, we have to do something and we have to think about what data is going to do to my life, to our our lives, and how society will change here. So so um, I think the crisis just has reached to a certain point that we have seen digital, like, a, like a, uh, a pace in digitalization that we would have rather expected in maybe three or four or five years that has been just done in the last three months. So I see it as a very positive um way how we get forced actually from nature to improve 
on things that we have been doing a certain way. And of course, it, it, it has opened up new perspectives also in the city. It has opened up new perspectives in how we treat environment. Like, for instance, I was just uh, starting uh, urban gardening, like m many other people did. Uh, and I never had time to do that. But due to the fact that I did not have to travel, I now can spend more time on the nice side of, of life, namely to, to grow nature on my garden uh, and things. So, so I think it, it like also with, with robotics, I mean, we, we also tried to change the, the attitude towards robotics in the last 10 years because robots have always been communicated in a very bad way from science fiction and so on. So, so I've heard from a lot of robot manufacturers that actually the association for robots in, uh, in architecture is the only really positive uh, way how to how to communicate robotics. Even though we did not do marketing, but as an architect, we we were just looking at the visions how we can incorporate robotics into our lives. And I think this is important also in terms of data. So so each time. When something is new, we are afraid of it until we understand how it's working. So I just think that the whole data uh, communication, if we give away too much data of ourselves or not, this is something we have to learn how to deal with. And uh, when we learn how to deal with, we probably will say, oh, sure, that's how it works. It's, it has not been too complicated. But of course, learning something new always means that um, it's uh, a passionate thing. And uh, I always try to say in German, passionate, it means Leidenschaft. So you have to suffer first before you get passionate. So I think it's, it's a very interesting time. Uh, and I don't see it as a depression. I see it just the other way around. I, I see it very cheerful and joyful. It's just the way how we, how we organize our immediate surrounding. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Lisa, unless you have another idea, I would now re like to read a question from the audience that I received. Okay, let's do let's uh, that first. I would just like to somehow span back to um, the anthropologic and um, sure, what, sure. what is our role as, as, as architects and how does it change? I mean, you know, and, and I would also maybe cast and talk about this a little bit since he's you know, sort of a first uh, generation um, computationalist in a way. Uh, so, um, but but let's do the questions first. You can, we, can, we can chat, you know, offline, but I think the audience out there uh, might not have the opportunity anymore. So, of course, I leave the stage to whoever is out there on the WebEx uh, microphones. Actually, this is this is very related to your question. The question that, which is from the audience is also to Kos. And and the question is is really um, am, am I is there a very very uh, disturbing feedback? Um, uh, the question is um, related to the uh, specialization in, in various fields that that we have. Um, and Kas actually talked about this in, in his in his talk. Uh, and we can answer this to, to Lisa's question as well, very, very easily. In, in digital architecture as an interdisciplinary topic, how far can the architects alone Cass, go? I think Cass is unmuted. Yes. No, not, not intentionally. It's, uh, my computer did it. <laughs> Okay, so uh, how do we make productive collaboration between architects and other disciplines, both in academia as well as in practice? Uh, That's the full question. Well, uh, the, the question is, having mind in computational digital architects as an interdisciplinary topic, how far the architects alone can progress in this field, learn from each others, etc., etc. But I think that we should tie this question to, to what Liz just said. In this multidisciplinary environment, how we as architects can support the, uh, the relevant global development goals, um, uh, 
and tying this to computation. Yeah, no. So okay. I would like you to talk about that a little bit, if that's okay. I'll try to uh, give some reflection and some observation that uh, you have been discussion, discussing. Um, usually, I don't go from a functional point of view for my work, for the work I do together with Ilona. Basically, there, there's not an urgency for it, what we do, but it can easily be linked to an urgency because it's uh, we are um, we want to empower open situations where we use the the computation as an instrument. For example, robotics. I don't see it as a tool. I see it as an instrument you play with. So, like with every instrument, you can play a lousy game. And you can play a very interesting, very challenging, very thrilling game. So that's up to the role actually you take up for yourself in such a game. And the ultimate purpose for me is not exactly a functional one. So I would like to use this platform maybe to argue for non-functional goals like and that is what we are involved in these days. So we do a, a big project in Qatar we are working on. Basically, we want to make very big projects of art, art projects that are environments that comply with all these issues we are discussing, but not necessarily an office building or another museum or another cultural complex but more like something that has an autonomy in itself, that has a value in itself, not depending on anything else. And in that sense, I think a much more active player in our social uh, structures, in our social tissues. So that brings me, of course, to the very much to the optimistic side of this, uh, well, you call it depression, I call it an obsession. I think everyone has an obsession, no? is checking numbers. How many deaths do we have today? How many casualties? And checking countries after countries. How are our neighbors doing? So basically, we are looking much more to each other than in other days. I'm even looking at you now, because, and I didn't do that for 10 or more years. <laughs> so there are opportunities here to link to each other in many, in many false ways and link this new network, and you can call it data or harvesting or anything, but it's a network which is full of data and full of intentions. We can link this, I think, genuinely to something that has a higher purpose than just function. Yeah? Our purpose as social beings, so to say. Well, I, I think it's a bit uh, out of the out of the discussion, but this is how we look at things. Excellent. Anybody want to add to that, please? Liz? please? Um, yeah, I can I can add to this because it's uh, actually it's great what you just said, Kaz, because we have, uh, of course, we've always had that dilemma in architecture. Uh, is it formal or is it functional? Is it both? Um, I would uh, like to take this on board and what I always tell my students and myself is um, whatever you do. Uh, actually, I, I don't even say it like this. I say what we do is beautiful. We're only doing beautiful things here mm -hmm. and whatever is not beautiful, I don't want to see. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, I think this is a joke in a way. But um, after about two sessions, they realized that I'm absolutely serious about this. Um, and, and that's the challenge. So how can we actually make extraordinarily beautiful things with, with, with amazing proportions, with texture, uh, with light reflections and refractions uh, that also somehow embed um, the, the, the notion of, of uh, Rainer Banham's machines, you know, as in you know, pipes and, and water and sewage and blah, blah, blah. And now we have uh, somehow the responsibility as architects to, that's my, my strong 
attitude here to object politics and say we are architects mm -hmm. but we still want to work towards the 17 sdgs but not because they are there but because we've done this anyways and I think this is an extremely exciting and, and difficult situation, not just for educators, but also for uh, for students. Uh, I suppose the ones who are in their uh, doctoral research are the ones who, who struggle most because they are in a limbo, going into formal architecture or am I going into something else? Um, uh, and I, I mean, I don't want to open this big kind of box of Pandora, but I think that it's very important to say, well, we are architects, so we have to do beautiful things. This is our social responsibility uh, and not only look into regulations where it says a one person household deserves 27 square meter mm -hmm. and a bathroom must not have a window. You know, so I find this is a, this is a long-standing dilemma, but it gets more and more complex, and it almost becomes like Rachel Armstrong was mentioning that yesterday. It this whole dilemma almost it doesn't become resumatic, but it becomes a dissipative structure that where, where, where different ecologies of architecture are actually intertwining. Mm -hmm. um, so now I could actually start for the next three hours, which I'm not doing. Um, but maybe somebody wants to respond to this uh, from an educational point of view. Well, I think it's just the definition of the economy. Economy is activity. It's not. It's not uh, imposed by the industry. What kind of activity it is? I, we can choose our own activities. And I fully agree with the, the beauty part of what you were saying. I think that is essential. That's why we do it. We do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, Liz, if that's okay with you, I want to go to a slightly different topic now. Is that okay? You are the moderator. It's your show. All right. No, no, we are sharing the job here. Remember? Okay, so uh, oh. we, we talked a lot about we talked a lot about uh, automation, robotics, um, computation, automation in the sense of also uh, AI and and things like this. But we also talked about biology and natural systems, and we saw uh, uh, presentations that are. Uh, like like the the excellent presentation from Rachel from Thomas as well as other presenters in the in the audience throughout the sessions which unfortunately I didn't get to attend most of them but I got to saw maybe uh, two sessions uh, how to learn meaningfully from biology and natural systems we as architects also um, I mean we we are super creative and 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 all that but when we borrow from other fields we also tend to borrow selectively and also a little bit manipulatively if if that's even a word uh, we we sometimes borrow terms that actually kind of abuse and misuse the underlying principles and concepts of that so how do we learn meaningfully from biology and natural systems and uh, how do how do we then also uh, link this to the to the issues of scaling because Architectural scale is quite different than the, the uh, phenomena that are sometimes that are occurring in, in nature and in biology. So how do we deal with this? I mean, we have seen many examples of this, but then the, the question is, what are the current limitations? Is it related to technology? Uh, the, for example, growing architecture. Uh, right now, I think it is not quite possible to to envision this in a in a living environment. It 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 kind of has to happen in an industrial environment and then transferred to to another place. But hmm. how do we see the future? So I just want to to open a question okay. uh, about architecture's relationship, the current limitations, and how do we envision this for the future. Who wants to answer that? Yes, Chris, sure. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm a, an engineer um, and uh, when I go to the beach, um, I can see the wind and the waves and I can build a sandcastle. 
And I know quite a lot about fluid mechanics and why waves break when they reach the beach and why a sandcastle will stand up sometimes and sometimes it will fall down. And I find that very interesting. And I wonder how anybody who doesn't know these things can actually get any enjoyment from going to the beach. Um, they seem to be missing so much that they don't understand these basic things. So I think that when it comes to learning from nature, it's, it starts, first of all, by understanding as much as we can uh, about nature and how it works. And um, that is interesting in itself. Uh, and then that understanding may help us in our work as, as engineers and architects. Uh, but it, start, it starts by, by understanding and a sense of wonder of, of how plants and animals and uh, inanimate objects uh, behave. Um, so uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's very difficult to know then how you take this knowledge and, um, uh, and apply it. And I think that, um, you know, there's the science of uh, biomimetics. I think it's much better not to say that we try and mimic nature, that uh, when you design an aeroplane, you don't mimic the birds. But you are inspired by the birds. So it's more about being inspired by nature rather than just a uh, blind copying. That's my view, anyway. Yes, thank, yeah. thank you, Chris. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I am fascinated about being able to enjoy the beach uh, if you do not have a scientific background. Thank you. Uh, I, I think Thomas. Yes. Sorry? Chris, I, Thomas, yes, Chris, please I, go ahead. Yeah. Chris, I fully agree. We had the discussion yesterday on that uh, ship with the class of beer. Um, I would like to go way back. It starts already in the, how, you, uh, how you are raised or how you grew up as a child. It should start in the preschool, in the kindergarten, and then through the years of schooling that we learn not just biology, but also chemistry, and that probably also learn how to garden. The, the famous Schreber garden in, in Germany is an example where you learn how nature is interacting with temperature, humidity, wind, etc., etc., and how the microcosmos and the bacteria are all intertwined. And for architecture, just to take a shortcut. We had, when I studied in Berlin, by the way, we had building biology, we had building chemistry. This is all taken out, at least in the US. We don't have that. These are elective courses. They should be required. And another example is I've been working for over 10 years in the 80s and 90s with uh, landscape architects and biologists, etc., for in the Ruhr Valley. You know, the post-industrial areas with phytoremediation, which is a bioremediation, a detoxifying process using types of plants to remove, transfer, and stabilize or destroy contaminants in the soil and also in the groundwater. And this is not something you can do with a cowboy approach, you know. You have to be collaborative. It's a participatory process with our experts, and you become a student. And you have to again relearn biochemistry, biology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is this is fundamental. When we go then into uh, let's say cloud-based meta platforms to use uh, bio nano tools, not nano tools to to program matter, or we understand bacteria, we we always have to go back and and relearn the fundamentals how we uh, survive. And in my presentation yesterday, I, I showed the, the oxygen problems of Biscayne Bay in Miami, which is the typical result of, of, of human um, urbanization. So we have an input, and then we have an output. Who cares about the output? It's the runoff, it's the toxic, the, the toxic materials, the oil, the nutrients that ends up in the bay. And then there's a, a, a mass fish killing. The fish is it's coming up to the surface to get the last sip of oxygen. But there's no wake-up call. 
There is no state of emergency. None of these mayors, including Democrats, have the guts, the balls to declare a state of emergency and retool and redesign the processes. That's my two cents. Maybe I just can jump in for a second because I think you raise quite important points. And also to that, what Chris was saying, I mean, um, I, I'm an architect, I'm an engineer. And um, for me, there are actually two terms when I come to the beach. Uh, that means if I see the wave, um, I can have the knowledge of how it works, but um, probably not the understanding. And that means for me that if you introduce these topics which you just mentioned to school, so it's you can develop and then, and then you can choose a student um, which topic you might pick to deepen it to get the understanding. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise it, it wouldn't be possible, let's say, in half a year to develop the understanding of a certain topic. This requires years and years. Yeah, and uh, we have the tools where uh, environmental impact analysis and life cycle analysis, etc., can be uh, integrated in the design process. And if you include also AI and machine learning, you get the results very quickly. And it's also something that helps us to understand, but we need to have the basic concept that we need to teach. And it, again, it starts right in preschool and should go through the university, even to the PhD, whatever. I think, I think many countries will, uh, are and will go more and more into this direction, but I would like to maybe ask Rachel to say a few things specifically about the scalability issue. Okay, thank you. Um, um, I must say, I'm someone who's gone the other way. I've started in science and come to architecture because it's um, a fantastic environment for wonder, enchantment, creativity, and synthesis, and immersion, and patience. And, um, you know, so I, I couldn't do that in the sciences. And I, I feel that, um, you know, architecture is an incredibly rich synthetic space. So, um, uh, so, so I, I don't want architecture to change. I, I love the fact it's so assimilative, and I think that architecture can cope um, with the new knowledge, with the new sciences. Um, you know, there's something very 21st century about architecture um, as a way of thinking and practice. But onto the scale of things, um, you know, traditionally, if we're looking um, at architecture through the humanistic lens, yes, the human body is the center of all. Um, activity. But I think as we um, move into the ecological era, we're working with different levels of scale um, and they're not linear. So you know, things happening at the quantum level do not scale linearly um, to even the micro scale. Um, and um, we're seeing things like, you know, co coherence and decoherence, these kinds of the forces between molecules starting to um, have effects. And I think what's quite interesting is that we actually start to inhabit different worlds at different scales and then draw relationships between them. So I think it's an incredible way of creative thinking. I don't think we have to solve this. I think there was um, a discussion earlier, I think Michael Hensel was mentioning about partial knowledge. I think as we move into the 21st century, the only knowledge we have is partial and how we actually relate the knowing that we have to the knowing that other people have to the knowing at one scale to the knowing at another scale um, i think it's actually the exercise of the practice of the academy of the uh, disciplines um, and i think this kind of piecemeal partly intuitive partly evidence-based um, partly emotional a mapping of the world and starting to reimagine, re envision, and re articulate it, I think is the work of, of the 21st century because I don't think that this century is the same as the last century. And I don't think we have the full set of knowledge, the full tool set. So for scales, um, different instruments, different worlds, um, different experiences, we can inhabit all the different scales, um, but the job is in the relating. Um, from the, let's say, the cosmic um, to, to the quantum and how we tell the stories in, in between. I don't think this is an exact science. 
Rachel, thank you. Uh, super interesting. Yes. Um, can we can we follow from this, please? Uh, anyone wants to follow from this? I'm thinking more into the 21st century architectural education angle. If nobody wants to follow, does anybody want to follow? Can you say again? So this this partial knowledge and how to relate from cosmic to to nano. Uh, and how to tie this to 21st century architectural education? My, my view is that the most difficult thing is to um, draw the boundary of, of, of where architecture stops. So if you take other disciplines like, I don't know, accountancy or um, the law or, or maybe even medicine, then um, you could perhaps draw a boundary around accountancy and say accountancy is about money and tax and stuff like that uh, whereas architecture is about um so many things it's obviously about uh, aesthetics as you as you've said about beautiful things um but it's also about uh, structure and materials and sustainability um uh, does it include things like planning on, a, on an urban scale uh, does it include landscape architecture um, uh, does it obviously does it include it does it, I forget, it does include things like uh, legislation, building regulations? I mean, there's just so many things. That, almost anything you could say is actually relevant to architecture. So uh, the difficulty is to um, draw those boundaries and then select within those boundaries what it is that you're going to try and and um, teach or educate your students. Um, uh, together with all sorts of other issues like employability, I, I mean, uh, do they have to be um, usable from day one, or is it part of the profession's role to uh, continue the education? Should we teach students to use digital tools in the university, or is that something they can learn in practice? Um, and so on. There's just so many questions. Uh, but where you draw the boundary, I think, is the, is the most difficult one. Yes, thank you, Chris. Perhaps uh, could um, I? Yes, please, please. Um, Who is? Michael. Oh, hi, Michael. Yes, please. Um, the interesting thing about architecture is a kind of pluralistic field is uh, that it's always uh, displaying a reflex to uh, kind of put down some anchors that uh, give a, a certain kind of level of certainty where the journey is going and call it function, call it form, call it beauty, call it all. These are all kind of anchors that give a certain kind of uh, uh, certainty of the journey but I, I think the journey itself is also an interesting thing to observe uh, what are ways of knowing in architecture and what are ways of producing knowledge in architecture and how do these relate to uh, other domains in which perhaps uh, ways of knowing and production of knowledge differs um, or if we add a temporal scale to it, if we look from a historical perspective, uh, how do we ensure that certain types of knowledge, certain ways of knowing, like tacit knowledge, for instance, is not entirely lost in its content, if not in its action? How do we transfer things that are already known, but in different ways that are maybe not easily compatible with our ways of producing knowledge and knowing. And how do we do we take care of this uh, heritage, let's say, uh, this knowledge heritage? I think one of the particularities of architecture is uh, the way uh, in which we are able to uh, proceed in generating knowledge through action. Design is a form of inquiry uh, that is uh, very interesting for other disciplines to latch onto. So we're looking only what's interesting for us to latch onto, but it's interesting also to observe that other uh, um, 
uh, disciplines like to latch onto architecture in order to be able to obtain or in order to enter into this kind of arena. I think uh, Rachel put that quite uh, quite well earlier on. So let's not forget about that because if we have this component, then we can discuss uh, about uh, education not so much only in terms of what the core values are for the education, but also uh, what the means by which are that are essential. In this case, then, computational methods are ways of elaborating, elaborating certain ways of generating knowledge of, of, of knowing, and they don't become so much a matter of, uh, oh, we shouldn't have digital tools in the school, and this school should have digital tools, and so on, because that's a kind of that's a kind of discussion that is more ideological rather than based in the questions of knowledge production. Can I say Anyone something? wants to add on to that? Me, please. Uh, Sorry? I would, I would like to, to add to this, actually. Yes, please. Go um, ahead, please. Now, uh, there's something that I that I witnessed. I don't know if it's the same as, as you, but uh, I witnessed that uh, a lot of the students we receive, uh, we receive, <laughs> it's very good, we receive from the bachelors, like the guys who sort of arrive to be further post-produced to become individuals, um, a lot of them uh, just cannot draw. I mean, draftsmanship, right? So what I want to say is, I think it's absolutely relevant to have a base knowledge of the basic tools, which is, I think, drafting, drawing, also working with your hands, craftsmanship, to then further and to then sort of use that basic knowledge and tools to take this into other disciplines or to integrate other disciplines. It's a bit like cooking, right? I mean, if you've never done like a, a, a sourdough, you will never know what you can do with it. Um, so the, the, the thing is that I have the feeling that we are kind of missing out one thing, which is very traditional drafting uh, figure figure drawing, life drawing uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, actually saying, we are not going to pretend anymore that we are working interdisciplinary, but we are now going to create a new course with the biological department, with the physics department, with the optical department, or the, the, the biotechnology. But these classes, these courses are just not there. On paper, they are. Our students can go to biotechnology and, and take a module. But where is the architectural educator and professor who can, in fact, also take this on board? So I want to say it would be good to cultivate, on one hand, very traditional draftsmanship with rapidographs, H4s, HBs, and so on, on one hand, and on the other hand, integrate systemically in the, the culture of architectural education the possibility to actually work together embed and intertwine uh, different kinds of knowledge so that we can do what michael is saying which is basically experiencing rather than consuming i think this is sort of the, the key here can i learn from this hmm. go ahead, please. yeah um, actually, this is uh, what Liz is saying is uh, well, very close to our hearts, only they have a, quite a different emphasis on what actually you should ask the students to draw. So we introduced this uh, at Qatar University and we asked the students to make drawings, but abstract drawings, uh, explicitly to not to mimic nature, but actually to design a new nature. And that really works very well. It liberates their minds. You can, you can really see that they are growing into their own universes, their own personal universes they are creating. So I think abstraction and creating your own language by doing things, by painting or making models, but abstract models without a specific function works absolutely absolutely very well and so i can only recommend this to implement this in the in the studies again but i would be afraid i would be a bit uh, 
no, not, not so happy, let's say, it, if it's back to the Beaux Arts, huh? if it's back to, okay, painting after nature. I don't think. No, no, I, mean, I mean, the skill, the skill of drawing. Yes, the skill. It's, it's not about what you draw, it, it's just no, about it's, the. It's your expression, to express yourself. Yeah. Can, can I jump in here? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, I think um, if to, to name it a little bit more abstract, I think what is from the cognitive side, because it's really the brain and hand um, communication. So we, what we do a lot is that we jump back and forth from the digital to the physical world. And I do not really, I'm not really so much interested in what tools they use, if it's an graph or whatever, but it's just the, the brain hand coordination that is essential for us because we as architects, we actually want to touch material and we want to, to uh, expand our senses to understand space, to understand materiality, to under understand the beauty of life. And this is important just to have these um, pedagogic pedagogical methods that we also use, for instance, when we work with robots, that the robot for me is like a tool, like a rabbit or another, or, or another tool that enables people to do, um, to expand their, 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 their visualization and also to expand the, the capabilities that the human body has. Yeah. And this is something which is, I think, interesting in education. And I would not also want to go back to the very, very traditional parts. In first, you have to copy the paintings and drawings, and then you know how to draw. Uh, I think it doesn't matter what tools uh, you're actually using, but the brain hand coordination is the same language that we have to train similar that mathematics and coding is a basic language that we all need to learn now. Yes, yes, yeah, Sigrid, I, I, like I, to... I agree. Ah, yes, Thomas, please, you go ahead, yes. I would like to add uh, to uh, the previous speaker that uh, it is very uh, fundamental that we are uh, looking at sensory approaches. Google Google House. I'm sure Kai knows him and uh, Michael and others. That's a typical approach to activate the sensory experience by using all the senses we have available. One exercise is always very successful to send students in a, in a space with no light and have barriers there and then uh, increase the temperature or, or other techniques so they can use their, sense, their, their senses to understand space and, and texture and, and materials. Now, I think the biggest challenge is, is uh, that we are dealing with this uh, accreditation boards. In the US, we have 55 licensing boards. And when these, uh, I call them troops, when they, are, when they arrive and, and occupy the school, they have this, uh, this checklist. Most of them even cannot hold a mouse or understand how, how to do gardening what life science means, it's all technical. And they do have these check boxes. And some even cannot even uh, use a laptop. So we have to create these binders, you know, pick up trucks for binders with, with materials so they can check off the boxes. I mean, this is a disaster. We need, to, we need to include life science like they do it in elementary schools. So I have to stress this again. Yeah. To the okay. Level. Maybe we have to also, I mean, the food nexus is also very important. Are we continuing to eat victims or are we going to uh, become um, plant a plant-based society and, and include herbal farming on our balconies, on our facades, on our rooftops, or in the garages that become obsolete in these universities where we have more buildings of, par of parking garages than actually other spaces? This needs to be all transformed. It needs a revolution. This cannot go on like this. We definitely do need a new paradigm. And this ties, I think, uh, to a question uh, that came from the audience, from, from Thomas Wortman, actually. And the question is from Michael. 
example, how can embedded architecture also be relevant to urban high density contexts? I think Thomas, this this ties in very well with what you just said. Yeah, let someone else answer. I guess. It's Michael. It's a question for Michael. Yeah, uh, I, I uh, tried to answer already briefly in the chat. Um, the the end game. Uh, or at least one of the end games of uh, embedded architecture is to um, uh, gain knowledge from different types of land uses that do not normally occur in urban environments. And then to try and see how these can be adapted for use in urban environments, not to leave this too general. Say, for instance, we, we look at particular types of food production, uh, which are particular to, uh, let's say, a land use assigned to agriculture. And we try to think uh, whether this needs necessarily to be in conflict with construction. And for instance, the, the uh, a lot of historical examples that we're looking at show that construction can actually enhance uh, food production. This is a, a field of research where my wife is very active. So we actually try to see whether these could be implemented in urban environments so that urban food production is not a question of leftover surfaces or leftover spaces, but of a really systemic level, uh, on the same level as the built object uh, uh, with which this type of activity would be integrated. So yes, one of the end games is actually to find uh, ways of addressing needs in urban environments uh, for which we perhaps presently don't yet have the, the best answer. Okay. Um... All right, thank you. Uh, but how, okay, this is the end game, but how do you see the progression of it? Like what, what are the steps towards your end game? If you can I'm talk not... a bit about it. Okay, um, well, first of all, uh, we are currently busy with a very large number of case studies uh, that we're doing in different uh, climate zones. Uh, in Europe, so we have not ventured outside of Europe with this research because it becomes overwhelming after a while in terms of its richness. Uh, and then we try both in practice and in um, academia to gradually work ourselves uh, forward from maybe rural environments towards suburban environments where there's a little bit more space where you can somehow negotiate with a greater amount of uh, um, uh, flexibility towards uh, already built up environments. So we're sort of halfway into getting a good understanding how particular uh, green systems, green infrastructure, food production, you name it, could be implemented in the densification process of suburban environments. We're not yet at the stage where we could make any meaningful statement about an already existing uh, fully built up urban core and the implementation there beyond, let's say, some very uh, superficial statements. I see. Yeah, thank you. OK, uh, I think that uh, Liz said that we need to stop in now less than five minutes. So I would like to please ask our audience if there is uh, any other burning and short question. And also the same way, if there are any other kind of final closing comments from, from any of our panelists, uh, please. Well, I um, want to say something. Maybe I'm just gonna make a short start. Um, I think, very short, I think we need to be positive. So good. Yes. Yes. Any other closing comments? Yeah. Yeah. has to create the more human. I mean, it has to be more than the human. So. Jill, could you please repeat it? Me? Um, yes, yeah, the architecture please. needs to be more than the human. It had a, a fantastic run of humanism, and now we need to have a leakier idea of what human responsibilities are. Excellent. Thank you. Well, maybe okay. Michael is next. Also. Oh, Kaz is next. Sorry, Kaz oh, is next. Kaz, sorry. please. Maybe we can also refer to the title of this ITAD conference, Anthropology. Basically, I don't see uh, the humans in the center of the universe. Not at all. 
So we are a player in a networked game, I would say, but we are not central. Actually, everything is central or nothing is central in the universe, like any molecule can be seen as the center of the universe. Any human, human being can be seen as the center, but it's only local and temporal. So we should not assume that we are leaders in any sense of uh, what is happening here on Earth or in the universe. So I just want to say that because I don't think it helps if we keep seeing ourselves as the cause and the effect of everything. We are not. Yes. Thank you, Kas. I completely agree with that, actually. Anyone else wants to make a closing statement? Yeah, Please I want to... I want to... finger. Sorry, Thomas, yes? Was that Thomas? Well, then, I, then I'm saying Thomas is uh, Thomas is muted. He's talking to himself. I just wanted I just wanted to add to uh, the cars that uh, we only represent a three quarter second on the on the timeline of spaceship Earth. Three quarter second. That's nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and uh, all right. Uh, Miss is raising her finger through the camera. Yes, please, please. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say something. I don't want to do the closing remarks yet, but we should actually do the closing, like the closing, closing thing uh, yeah. soon. I just want to say I'm extremely surprised that um, we even ask the question or even consider that we are somehow relevant, right? I mean, uh, I wouldn't want to. I would not want to. Um, include semantics into uh, into a, a systemic uh, a cybernetic um, a kind of a system of, of several kinds of physics that were happening here so i mean it's it's a systemic nature that we have and uh, we are some sort of uh, i would say typology of agents that is somehow behaving in a certain way and that's just what it is so um not more and not less and we are not relevant we're just a part of the game and the calculus and i think that's the beauty of it i mean you know when you start looking at the world like a cybernetician like what i've been doing for like the last 20 years um i don't put ontologies or semantics or emotions into anything like this uh, i just look at it as a complex system with feedback loops and, and multiple relationships and levels and um, you know, it's much healthier, and uh, I think we can also take uh, more what we would call rational uh, decisions, but I would just call them uh, systemic decisions or uh, following the goals, you know, so we are, we are agents in a cybernetic system that is following a goal, or maybe two or three, and, and that's pretty cool, because that takes a lot of responsibility off our shoulders. <laughs> All right, excellent. Like, like EKD, Dietmar, it's off our shoulders. Can you see me? Off your shoulders. <laughs> excellent job. Thank you so much. All right, so shall we call this roundtable session closed? Um, maybe we, before we close it, uh, I think we not open another session. Um, maybe we do an end somehow officially to the EKD. Right. All right. So I give my duty to you guys. Thank you so much again. Um, thank thanks to the my pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thanks to Absolutely. Everyone. And thank you to all our guests. Um, uh, maybe um, I'm just going to make the start. So the officially ad um, can be done by Liz. So, um, however, we are in the same room, so it would be the same time zone. Um, yeah, the EKD 38 in Berlin, no digital. Um, well, I assume it has been a stressful situation for everybody over the past months, and I guess we are all happy that we could let become this year EKD reality, which would have not been possible without the assistance of our whole team here at the TU Berlin, as well as the EKD team and the proceedings teams. Um, by the way, thank you, Gabriel. Um, without you, I think we wouldn't have any printed proceedings here. Um, actually, what we faced is, um, was an organizational problem that it was a huge problem, actually, to acquire sponsors in these times. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, therefore, we are very grateful to our sponsors who believed in an online event. 
which were Bentley, DFG, Biomimetics, Die Gesellschaft von Freunde Technik Universität Berlin, and um, where I'm currently sitting, the Sci-Fi Lab. And nevertheless, we missed to meet the EKD community, uh, community physical, and looking really forward to meet everybody in person next year in Novi Sad. So I think it's uh, quite important. I mean, you see, it works digital, but to meet everybody in person, I think um, that's essential. And maybe what was very positive about this year's EKD is that we could even open it also for free attendees, so who are not presenting a paper, and there was we could generate a broader audience worldwide through diverse time zones. And I think, especially with this roundtable, having this talk about education, maybe we could trigger you know young architects to develop new knowledge and maybe future understanding. So if we can summarize some of the keynotes, it seems that the field of architect uh, is in constant transition and digital transition, which opens new possibilities. However, we should also not forget where the roots are of digital architecture, and especially that we need to develop an exact position in the coexistence to algorithms. Again, I mean, we are deeply honored to host it this year's EKD, and we were overwhelmed by the number of abstracts we have received in the first stage and the full papers which are contributing to the actual debate of the Anthropocene. Um, thank you, and I would like to hand over now to Liz. Thank you very much, Diva. Um, I think we had so much content, I'm not gonna get into this uh, this more, but I think the words from Diva were uh, really, really wonderful. Now, I would like to point out, uh, yes, of course, thank you all. Thanks to, to the guys who are like out there and listening to us, because uh, without uh, you, we would not have that conference either. So it's not only about the organizers and the supporters, but it's of course uh, about the ones who, who join this with their knowledge. Um, uh, I would like to, to mention uh, the team, uh, and I would like to actually read their names because they, they deserved it. They work very hard. They so they do very hard around here. Uh, this is Luna, uh, Luna Albondaki, Martin Bayer, uh, Tunisha Baron Bazaran, Ezra Pumet, uh, Jennifer uh, Young, Valne Kastrati, uh, Teresa Luz, uh, uh, Surya Ver Padnaik, Anna Hussein, Rasi Ferrati, Sebastian Fischdoch. Uh, Pavel Unger, um, then we have Carmen Kreuz, Peter Fischer and his team uh, with Samuel and Christoph uh, and Arthur uh, who have been helping here. We also would like to, of course, thank the Institute of Architecture for letting us use their premises and uh, the new valuable equipment downstairs. Um, our director, Professor Mislovitz, who also opened the session uh, yesterday. And I would also like to thank Dietmar a lot, who um, kind of took that weird idea on board, which I gave in 2016 and said, let's just do this. We had no idea what it was. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we have to thank, of course, ICAD uh, Council to um, to let us allow doing this. You know, it's uh, it's it's an honor and uh, we're very glad that, uh, that they trusted us on uh, carrying this through and um, pushing ICAD a little bit further in hopefully the right direction, whatever that means. Um, in that sense, I can only uh, say uh, again, thank you. And uh, uh, we will also share a link with all of you for the proceedings. You know that the proceedings are, uh, of course, online. Uh, they are also available uh, in print. Uh, we would, of course, very much appreciate if, um, if you informed your university libraries to uh, possibly purchase them. Uh, so that the students can dwell uh, within the two thick volumes uh, and, and actually touch them and feel them, smell them, work with them, rather than just uh, browsing through uh, through the papers. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if there's anybody else who wants to say something, but otherwise I would say, have a great journey back home. <laughs> Okay. Thank, you, Liz. Thank you, everybody. So, see you next year in Novi Sad. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you, everybody. Thank you. And all keep in touch. Bye -bye. Come to Berlin. Bye bye. <laughs> bye, -bye.